When societies were still mostly rural and agricultural, waste disposal was hardly an issue, partly because people tended to make use of everything, and partly because there was plenty of space to bury rubbish. It was when societies became predominantly urban and industrial that problems arose, mainly to do with health. City authorities had a hard time trying to find efficient ways of getting rid of all the rubbish. One of these was to get people to sort out their rubbish into different types, just as these days we are encouraged to separate our rubbish into different categories for easier removal and recycling. So, for example, kitchen rubbish was set aside and used for feeding animals. However, fears of disease put an end to that. In fact, it wasn't until the twentieth century that all waste was simply thrown together and ploughed into landfills. Classified advertisements placed by individuals in newspapers and magazines are not covered by the Advertising Standards Authority's Code of Practice. If you happen to buy goods that have been wrongly described in such an advertisement and have lost money as a result, the only thing you can do is bring a case against the person who placed the advertisement for misrepresentation or for breach of contract. In this case, you would use the small claims procedure. Which is a relatively cheap way to sue for the recovery of a debt. If you want to pursue a claim, you should take into account whether the person you are suing will be able to pay damages should any be awarded. Dishonest traders are aware of this, and often pose as private sellers to exploit the legal loopholes that exist. That is, they may claim they are not in a position to pay damages. In the 19th century, few people could afford to travel abroad. It was expensive, and there weren't the mass transport systems that we have today. So curiosity about foreign lands had to be satisfied through books and drawings. With the advent of photography, a whole new dimension of reality became available. Publishers were not slow to realize that here was a large new market of people hungry for travel photography. And they soon had photographers out shooting the best-known European cities, as well as more exotic places further away. People bought the pictures by the millions, and magic lantern shows were presented in schools and lecture halls. Most popular of all, however, was the stereoscopic picture, which presented three-dimensional views and was considered a marvel of Victorian technology. Stem cells are the body's master cells, the raw material from which we are built. Unlike normal body cells, 
they can reproduce an indefinite number of times and, when manipulated in the right way, can turn themselves into any type of cell in the body. The most versatile stem cells are those found in the embryo at just a few days old. This ball of a few dozen stem cells eventually goes on to form everything that makes up a person. In 1998, James Thompson announced that he had isolated human embryonic stem cells in the laboratory. At last, these powerful cells were within the grasp of scientists to experiment with, understand, and develop into fixes for the things that go wrong. The European Economic Community was established in 1957, its aim was, in broad terms, to move towards closer political and economic cooperation. Today, the much larger European Union has a far-reaching influence on many aspects of our lives, from the conditions we work under, to the safety standards we must adhere to, and the environment in which we live. In order to achieve the free flow of goods and services, workers and capital between the member countries, they needed to establish mutual policies in areas as diverse as agriculture, transport and working conditions. When they had agreed on these policies, they became law. Now, though, the EU is concerned with a far wider range of issues. When you hear things like human DNA differs from chimp DNA by only a couple percent, you can't help but wonder, how can that be? How can so few changes make such a big difference? Researchers working with fruit bats and mice think they have an answer, and it lies less in the animal's genes than in the short snippets of DNA that control when and where and how vigorously genes are turned on. If you've ever thought that a bat is basically just a rodent with wings, you're not too far from the mark. One of the most obvious differences between bats and mice is their forearms. Mice have these stubby little legs, and bats have these large, leathery wings. But even those differences are not as major as you might imagine. Mice and bats both have a gene called PRX1, which regulates limb development. But the gene is more active in the budding wings of bats. So the researchers took the piece of DNA that controls PRX1 activity from a bat and stuck it into a mouse. The result, pictured in the January 15 issue of Genes and Development, mice that have longer front legs. Okay, they didn't sprout wings, but the study shows that even small changes can have big consequences. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Wade Gibbs. Got a minute? If you want to see evolution at work, visit a hospital.
Inside a sick patient, antibiotics wipe out infectious bacteria by the millions, but germs are always mutating. A few adapt to resist the drug, so they survive and spread. Such antibiotic-resistant bacteria infect 2 million Americans every year. They kill 23,000. In this arms race between medicine and evolution, evolution is winning. But could we turn evolution against bacteria? It turns out that when bacteria mutate to become resistant to one antibiotic, they often become more vulnerable to a different drug. So maybe after a jab with the left, a roundhouse to the right will deliver a knockout blow. Down goes Frazier! To test this idea, researchers in Denmark dosed batches of E. coli with 23 different antibiotics and waited for resistance to evolve. In three quarters of the cases, the mutant germs became more susceptible to a second drug. The work appears in the journal Science Translational Medicine. One particular combination of widely used antibiotics, genomycin, then cefuroxime, then genomycin again, and so on, looks like it could hold the bugs at bay indefinitely. Resistance is futile. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Wade Gibbs. Fed up with the polar vortex? If so, consider this. Shivering may actually share some of the benefits of exercise, at least in terms of burning fat. Researchers studied shivering in a group of 10 men and women. First, the volunteers rested under a temperature-controlled blanket, which dropped from 80 degrees Fahrenheit to a chilly 54. Then they cycled on an exercise bike. Researchers took blood samples during both activities. Turns out shivering and exercise spurred muscles to secrete similar amounts of irisin, a hormone that tells brown fat to turn up the furnace, even though exercise took 10 times as much effort. The researchers say the metabolic pathway may have evolved to save us energy. Shivering alone is a costly survival mechanism. It relies on muscle contraction to warm us, whereas shivering activated brown fat can convert chemical energy directly to heat. This study's in the journal Cell Metabolism. As for your home thermostat, study author Francesco Celli of the NIH likes to keep his at 68, low enough to turn on brown fat. And it's a win-win. You'll save money on heat because you're making your own. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. The 1976 Mars Viking landers didn't find any life on the red planet, but maybe they weren't looking right, because at least one researcher thinks that a tenth of a percent of the Martian soil tested by the Vikings could actually have had a biological origin. The Dutch researcher Joop Houtkooper presented his ideas on August 24th at the meeting of the European Planetary Science Congress in Potsdam. One Viking test measured unexplained rises in oxygen and carbon dioxide when it was incubating some soil samples. Houtkooper conjectures that the incredibly dry and cold surface of Mars might be home to living cells. Such cells, however, would need to be filled with a mixture of water and hydrogen peroxide, which could stay liquid in the harsh conditions. And if the Viking landers happen to scoop up any of these strange cells, their breakdown products would be in line with the oxygen and carbon dioxide measured. The biomass would then represent a tenth of a percent of the Martian soil by weight, which is, interestingly, comparable to levels found in some Antarctic permafrost. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky.
Iron is a great material for making tools, but the oldest known iron artifacts were actually intended for decoration, nine Egyptian beads that date back to 3200 BC. And now we know that this ancient jewelry has an even more impressive origin. The iron out of which it was crafted came from space. The metal cylinders were discovered in Egypt in 1911. To analyze the structure and chemical composition of the beads, researchers bombarded them with neutrons and gamma rays. The tests revealed that the jewelry contained trace elements not present in earthly ores, but that are found in iron-rich meteorites. The study is in the Journal of Archaeological Science. The meteoric metal was hammered flat and rolled into beads more than 5,000 years ago. This date is some 1,500 years before the invention of smelting. That technique made it possible for terrestrial iron to be shaped into tools and to supplant copper and bronze as civilization's metal of choice. The new finding shows that long before smelting revolutionized tool use, some humans were already iron men. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Sophie Bushwick. There are hot peppers like the jalapeno, and then there are incendiary peppers like the legendary habanero. Now there's a new variety of thermonuclear habanero known as the tiger paw NR habanero. The name comes from its appearance. The bright orange pepper resembles a tiger's paw, and the NR stands for nematode resistant. The pepper was bred by U.S. Department of Agriculture scientists to be resistant to nematodes, roundworms that attack the plant's roots. The pepper was bred conventionally, not genetically engineered, and it does away with the need to use the soil fumigant methyl bromide, which is being phased out. So how hot is the tiger paw habanero? Pepper hotness is measured on something called the Scoville heat scale. A jalapeno comes in at about 5,000 on the Scoville scale. A regular habanero usually scores at least 100,000. And the tiger paw habanero tops the Scoville scale at almost 350,000. In fact, there's a legend that eating habanero peppers can have the side effect of actually making you deaf but only so that you cannot hear your own screams. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. Got a minute? The Nobel Prize in Chemistry goes to three men who revolutionized molecular life science, Japan's Osama Shimomura and Americans Martin Chalfie and Roger Tsen. They developed tools to light up and see individual proteins inside living cells. These tiny molecular flashlights make it possible to study numerous events that take place in cells and whole organisms that were previously invisible, such as the development of nerve cells or the spread of cancer cells. In 1962, Shimomura, now Emeritus Professor at the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole, discovered that jellyfish produce a green fluorescent protein, GFP, that glows when exposed to ultraviolet light. Some 30 years later, Columbia University's Chalfie showed that the GFP gene could be put into any organism. By making sure the fluorescent protein was expressed at the same time as other proteins of interest, researchers could literally light up events they want to follow. Then Sen at the University of California, San Diego, engineered fluorescent proteins in various colors. The multicolor palette enables researchers to follow multiple biological processes at the same time. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky.
New parents can act pretty strangely. For example, they often have an obsessive interest in what comes out of their baby's bottoms. Now researchers at Stanford University join them in their diaper diving to explore when and how bacteria colonize the human gut. Adults harbor complex microbial ecosystems within their GI tracts. These bacteria help digest food and contribute to a healthy immune system. But when a baby's born, its intestine is devoid of bacterial inhabitants. Within days, however, a cavalcade of microbes set up shop, establishing a vibrant intestinal community whose residents soon outnumber the baby's own cells. The researchers found that the early months were chaotic, with established species disappearing and new ones taking their place. But by the time the babies were 12 months old, each harbored a dynamic but unique collection of intestinal fauna. A set of fraternal twins had the most similar bugs, which suggests that genetics may have something to do with which bacteria stick around. Next, I'll look at how formula versus breast milk affects a baby's intestinal ecosystem. With so many questions left to explore, the researchers will no doubt be mining diapers for some time to come. Various studies have suggested that eating garlic can be good for you. It's been credited with lowering blood pressure, protecting against heart disease, preventing blood clots, even fighting off colds. Now researchers from the University of Alabama at Birmingham think they have a better idea how garlic might work its medicinal magic. The Alabama team exposed red blood cells to the juices pressed from a standard supermarket-issue clove of garlic, and they found that the garlic-soaked cells started giving off hydrogen sulfide, which is the gas that gives rotten eggs their delightful bouquet. Okay, I know you're probably thinking that smelling like sewage seems even more odious than reeking of garlic. But on a molecular level, a pinch of hydrogen sulfide can be just what the doctor ordered. Because hydrogen sulfide serves as a chemical messenger that helps relax blood vessels and increase blood flow, which could explain some of garlic's cardiovascular benefits. Of course, more studies are needed to show whether a clove a day really does keep the doctor away. In the meantime, enjoy your garlic bread, and don't worry about the garlic breath. Just think what the insides of your arteries must smell like. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. This will just take a minute. Any successful business person can tell you about the importance of FaceTime, actually sitting down with clients, coworkers, maybe even competitors. But there may be even more to this whole face-to-face -face business than meets the eye, or exactly as much as meets the eye, because a new study from Tufts University suggests that the success of a corporation rests squarely on the face of its CEO. The researchers took photos of 50 CEOs from the highest and lowest ranked Fortune 1000 companies and they showed these pictures to a group of undergrads. They asked the students to rate each face on whether its owner looked competent, dominant, likable, mature, or trustworthy. What they found is that the students' impressions tracked with company profits. The more powerful and leader-like the CEO appeared, the more successful the corporation, even though the CEOs were all pretty much middle-aged white guys in ties. The study, which will appear in the February issue of Psychological Science, does not say whether profitable companies tend to promote people who look like leaders, or whether successful CEOs grow to look the part. Either way, looks like a company's financial about-face can actually be about-face. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin.
This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Cynthia Graber. This will just take a minute. How frequent are nightmares for toddlers and what causes them? Those are questions researchers at the University of Montreal hope to answer. They asked parents of about a thousand children to estimate the occurrence of their child's nightmares from age two and a half through age six. The parents were also questioned about their child's disposition. First, it turns out that nightmares aren't so frequent. About a third of the parents reported no nightmares at all. And then there's the second result. Kids who were called difficult as early as five months were more likely to suffer from nightmares as toddlers. And the ones who had a year and a half were more anxious, more likely to cry, and more difficult to calm down were also more likely to have bad dreams. The study authors say this means children may be, well, like little adults. It's already well established that adults tend to express real-life stress and emotional problems as nightmares. The researchers suggest that focusing on the kids' daytime issues and on parenting techniques may help banish nighttime demons. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Cynthia Graber. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. This will just take a minute. For those interested in preserving the environment, this week brings sobering news about ethanol. This fuel, distilled from plants like corn and switchgrass, has been widely touted as an eco-friendly, clean-burning alternative to gasoline. But a study published this week in the journal Environmental Science and Technology suggests that replacing our current gas guzzlers with vehicles that burn ethanol would actually increase pollution and damage human health. Stanford scientist Mark Jacobson used a computer model to predict air quality in the year 2020, when ethanol-powered cars were expected to be widely available in the U.S. His simulation showed, among other things, that cars that burn a blend of 85% ethanol will significantly increase ozone, a prime ingredient in smog. So in a world where the cars run on switchgrass juice, more people will get asthma, more people will be hospitalized with respiratory distress, and more people will die from breathing in ozone than if we kept on driving our gas-powered clunkers, at least according to Jacobson. So if you want to celebrate Earth Day this weekend, raise a glass of bubbly to our beautiful planet. Just don't share any with your gas tank. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. Got a minute? A direct effect on human health related to climate change is the likely increase in infectious diseases transmitted by insects or through contaminated water. In the March 25th issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, infectious disease researcher Emily Schumann points out that insects are more active at higher temperatures and broaden their range. Altered weather patterns bring drought to some areas, flooding to others, and a higher likelihood of water contamination to both. The World Health Organization predicts a 3 to 5 percent increase in the population at risk for malaria, with a temperature increase of 2 to 3 degrees Celsius, and 2 degrees is our best case scenario right now. The WHO also sees 10 percent more diarrheal diseases related to unclean water by 2030 due to climate change. Schumann urges the development of warning systems to spot disease outbreaks early, along with continued research into treatments and vaccines, which, she writes, will go a long way in preventing human suffering that could otherwise occur as a result of climate change. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky.
This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Katherine Harmon. Got a minute? On Election Day, where do you vote? If it's in a church, you might be inclined to vote more conservatively than if you cast your ballot at a school or government building. That's according to research published in the International Journal for the Psychology of Religion. And the effect seems to hold, whether you're Christian, Muslim, or agnostic, progressive, independent, or conservative. The study found that when random people were surveyed in front of a church, they gave more socially and politically conservative responses than people surveyed while standing in front of a government building. The shift in people's attitudes, the researchers suggest, was likely a result of visual priming, meaning that people who could see the religious building were, consciously or not, getting cues that influenced their response. The surveys were conducted in Europe, so it's possible American voters might react differently. But the survey included subjects from more than 30 countries to try to minimize a particular national bias. So, before you cast your vote this election year, think about whether your view is influencing your views. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Katherine Harmon.